Hello everyone. Today we will talk about the group testing problem. Suppose you have 7,000 friends, and some of them are six. Suppose that you know at most six of them are six, and you want to figure out which ones they are. You can test people, but tests are kind of expensive. So you figure that maybe you can test more than one person can test. Have them spit into the same tube or something. A test comes back positive if any of the participants are six. How many tests do you actually need to figure out who the six people are? Also, note that the tests take time to process, so you can't decide who to test based on the outcome of the previous test. You have to send them all in at once. More generally, let's say we have n people, and at most p of them are six. How many tests do we actually need? Obviously, we can just test everyone individually, and that will be enough to tell. So we can do it in n tests, but can we do better? One thing that may hint at a possibility to do better is that with n tests, the number of possible outcomes is a lot less than the number of situations. Think about it. There is no way all 7,000 tests come back positive. But we still account for that in our strategy. We haven't actually used the information that at most six people are six. Let's try to think of something. Let's represent a testing strategy with this grid, where the columns correspond to people and the rows correspond to tests. We color a box green if that person participates in that test, and we color it gray otherwise. So our first solution of testing everyone would look something like this. Our goal is to make this grid as short as possible. Okay, now suppose we have some testing strategy. Let's look at a specific person. Obviously, if any of your tests are negative, then you're not sick. But even if all of them are positive, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're sick. There could be some other sick person participating in every one of your tests. However, it would be nice if this didn't happen. It would be nice if all positive tests meant that you're sick. Then, the algorithm for determining who's sick would be very simple. You're sick if and only if all your tests come back positive. So how do we think of such a testing strategy? Let's look at what our strategy needs for this algorithm to work. Suppose these are the sick people in our group. We want everyone who's not sick to have a negative test. So everyone who's not sick needs a test where no sick people participate. However, we don't know who the sick people actually are. So this has to be true for any group of at most t people, not just the sick ones. In other words, for every group of at most t people, and for every person not in that group, we want there to be a test where the person is included, but no one in the group is. We can actually see that our simple strategy of testing everyone fits that condition. But our goal was to find solutions where we don't need that many tests. Checking every possible strategy would take a long time, and we don't even know if a better solution exists. So how do we do this? This is where the tricks begin. We will use polynomials to think of a strategy. Let's step away from testing people and look at polynomials for a second. Let's use some prime numbers. Call it p. Let's look at specifically polynomials with integer coefficients mod p. So a coefficient of p is the same thing as a coefficient of 0. p plus 1 is the same thing as 1. p plus 2 is the same thing as 2, and so on. That way, we really only have p options for each coefficient. The numbers 0 through p minus 1. Also, let's pick some number k and only look at polynomials of degree less than k. That way, we only have k coefficients to choose. Since there are p options for each coefficient, there are a total of p to the k polynomials. Now, for each polynomial, let's plug in all possible values of x. Since we're working mod p, there are only p values we can plug in, the numbers 0 through p minus 1. Note that this is the same thing as the numbers 1 through p. Let's plug them all in and put the numbers in a stack. Let's do this for all p to the k of our polynomials. Now we have p to the k stacks. 
Let's look at two different stacks that come from two different polynomials, f and g. I claim that they match in less than k spots. Now this isn't obvious, so let's examine why this is true. Let's see why my claim is reasonable. f matches g is the same thing as f of x is equal to g of x for some x. This is the same thing as f minus g of x is zero. In other words, we're trying to show that f minus g has less than k roots. Let's go back to our normal world of polynomials without any mods. Notice that non-zero linear polynomials have at most one root. Quadratic polynomials have at most two roots. Cubic have at most three, and so on. It seems like a polynomial with degree k can't have more than k roots. This is because if some number a is a root, then x minus a is a factor of f. So, if a1, a2, a3, all the way up to ak are all roots of f, then x minus a1 times x minus a2 times all the way up until x minus ak divides f. But that thing already has degree k, so f must have degree at least k. I won't prove it, but this is actually also true for polynomials mod any prime number. I'll put a link to an explanation in the description. Let's go back to our two stacks. Since f and g had degree less than k, f minus g also has degree less than k. Also, since f and g are different, f minus g is non-zero. By the fact that I did not prove, f minus g has less than k roots. So f and g match in less than k spots. And that's what we wanted to prove. Let's look at a specific stack and some group of t other stacks. It matches the first one in the group in less than k spots. It matches the second one in the group in less than k spots. And so on for every stack in the group. So, there are less than k times t spots where it matches something in the group. There are a total of p spots, so if k times t is less than p, then there is some spot where it doesn't match anything in the group. In other words, for any group of t stacks, and another stack not in that group, we have a spot where they are different. This is suspiciously similar to our goal for creating the testing grid in the beginning. But here, we have stacks of numbers, and there we had green and gray boxes. So, it's not exactly the same. How do we connect the two? Let's do another trick. Let's take every number in our stacks and expand them vertically. Each number becomes a mini stack of p boxes. They're all going to be colored gray, except the one that corresponds to the number, which we will color green. So like the number 3 would turn into a mini stack where the third box is green. We can see that if a stack had a spot that was different from everything in some group, now there is a green box in that stack that is gray in every stack in the group. This means that we can take our expanded polynomial stacks and put them together to form a grid for a testing strategy. And this strategy has the property that we wanted, as long as kt is less than p. There are p to the k stacks, and each stack consists of p mini stacks of height p. So the height of our grid is p squared. We have now created a strategy that identifies t6 people out of a group of p to the k people with only p squared tests. With the right choice of p and k, this is a lot better than our original strategy of testing everyone in the beginning. Okay, let's look at a specific example. Let's choose the prime p to be 19 and the number k to be 3. Then, we can choose t equals 6 because k times t is still less than p. We can create 19 cubed different polynomials of degree less than 3. Using them, we can form 19 cubed stacks of height 19. Then, we can expand the numbers into mini stacks to get a grid of height 19 squared. So, we have created a strategy for finding 6 sick people out of a group of 19 cubed people with only 19 square tests. 19 cubed is approximately 7,000, and 19 squared is about 360 or so.
So, this is a way better solution for finding which of your friends are sick. Nice. Now, let's do some math to see how good our construction actually is. Feel free to skip this part if you don't like algebra. Let's say we have n people, at most t of which are sick. How many tests do we need using our construction? First, note that if we create a strategy that can identify more sick people or deal with a larger group, it also works in our situation. We're looking to choose a k and a prime p for our construction. We want to pick a small p because the number of tests is p squared, and we want as little tests as possible. However, our p and k must also satisfy the inequalities p to the k is greater than n, and k times t is less than p, as we saw when we created the construction. From the second inequality, we get k is less than p over t. Plugging this into the first, we have p to the p over t is greater than n. We can take the logarithm of both sides to get p over t times log p is greater than log n. So, p log p is greater than t log n. If we choose p greater than t log base t of n, then p log p is greater than p log t, because we chose p to be greater than t, and p log t is greater than t log base t of n times log t by our choice of p. And that is just t log n using log rules. So this choice of p works. But remember that p must also be prime. Another fact I won't prove is that there's always a prime between any number and double that number. So we can find a p between t log base t of n and 2t log base t of n. So the number of needed tests is at most p squared, which is at most 4t squared log base t of n squared. This is a lot better than n for small t and large n. That's pretty good, but can we do even better? Notice how our condition about every healthy person having a negative test is asking for more than we need. It might be possible to rule out someone being sick even if all their tests are positive by examining the other results somehow. So our method isn't necessarily the best we can do. So, what is the best we can do? That's an open question that I'll leave you to think about.